So it, it, is it different from non-union? <laughs> <laughs> it's different. What, what do you mean? Is, because uh, as Dr. Sivaj has said, this is some new terminology that we are being exposed to. We have, whenever there is a fracture, these sequela can be of three types. One is that it unites either in good alignment or mal united. And the other possibilities, two possibilities are delayed union and non union. So out of these three, where does this fit? Does it simplify your life? It's mal united. Still, uh, factor and subpain. Mm -hmm. How old is the age? Two and a half years. A child of this age, forearm fracture, in what is the reasonable time in which it should unite? Six to eight months. So, almost double the time has elapsed. Still, it has been. You feel it has still not united. So, is it a delayed union or non union? Delayed him. Okay. So can you see she she has pain everywhere. Yes. She has pain everywhere. That doesn't mean that uh, there is a there is a ununited fracture or a delayed union. Is there any demonstrable mobility there? Only in the ulnar side there is a minimal abnormal mobility. Ulnar side? In the ulnar side. So you could isolate under yes, mobility from radial mobility precisely. Has anybody else also seen this patient or not? Nobody else? Because I try to uh, usually for the hand we do not use this terminology. Okay. Uh, though you may be technically right, I'm not saying that this is a wrong impression. But I would be more happy to say it's a completely paralyzed hand. Global. Okay. So because there are no movements. Okay. Uh, you also said that there is a subacute vocalized hysteria. Even this terminology is uh, yeah, heard for the first time. It's not usual terminology. Uh, what do you what do you what are you trying to convey? It's already developed up in following surgery mm -hmm. and uh, there is the available range of uh, risk in the open cell is positive. And, uh, you want to say it is established or non-established? Non-established. Yeah, that's why it's a uh, subacute. So this is a stage of uh, BIC which you are describing? Yes, sir. What are the stages according to you? Yes, <coughs> established and non-established. Two types. But, but in the... You never said which year are you which you which year are you Second. Okay, can you demonstrate the Walkman sign to me in this session? With the extension of a wrist, sir. Just a minute, let the camera focus on it. So everybody can see. Then if you try to extend the MCP joint. What is the position of the wrist? Wrist is now it's in the maximum extension position. Okay. Then once you uh, farmer flex, then we feel do that the uh, extension of MCP joint will be more than two. Will be more or we demonstrate what are what is the workman sign positive? Flex the wrist, flex the wrist more. This is the maximum positive. This is the maximum. Yes. Now you try to extend the fingers, let us keep the wrist flexed. Yes sir. Okay. Then in whatever maximum extension possible. You are letting the wrist also extend like What are the deformities in a workman's ischemic contraction? It will be 
ni usual deformities so the elbow below elbow if there is uh, below elbow there will be yeah, let's you tell us from proximal to distal okay connection of the forearm and the wrist flexion then there will be in six or yeah. minus there can be a flexion deformity at the elbow also okay. okay start with that Flexion of the elbow and the potential deformity of the forearm, flexion of the elbow and the wrist, then extension at the then CP joint and flexion at the wrist. And what about the thumb? Thumb will be affected. So, does this patient demonstrate the classical deformities? Which one? Is the wrist in flexion? Is the wrist in flexion? Forearm is in pronation, is in extension. Forearm is in pronation. There is no extension. MCP joints are in extension and MCP joints are in extension. I have a finger pencil. The wrist range of motion is grossly restricted. It's about 10 to 15 degrees. That's why we are not able to demonstrate very effectively. But yes, it is getting corrected on flexion to some extent. All right. So rather than calling it subacute, I think it would be better if the Oakman sign is demonstrably positive. We can call it Oakman's ischemic contraction. Severe grade. Why severe? Because in spite of the fact that the deformities are not, not severe, the deformities are not severe, but we still grade it as a severe one. Why? Very good. So because all the three nerves, all the three nerves in this patient are involved, so it, it, it categorizes it into a severe degree of Bokeman's ischemic contraction. Alright? Uh, how would you say that all the three nerves are involved? Is it a complete is it a complete involvement or a partial involvement? I think it's complete. Uh, why? Because both the motor and the sensations are low. Okay. So is is this sensation there in any one of these three? Below. So it's an anesthetic hand. It's a totally anesthetic hand. Both median and other nerve distribution are involved. And probably the radial. I did not check the radial. You must have done it. So even that is involved. So it's a anesthetic hand. It's a completely paralyzed hand, and the open sign is all about it. So this qualifies it into a severe grade of open. Uh, what we do? Do what? Is there any other possibility? Differential diagnosis. Hmm? No, no. So do you get a do you get a sensory loss in that? Does the hand become anesthetic? Motor loss, motor loss is not there. And pulse is alright? Yes, sir. Pulse is alright. Alright. Very nice physical sign. It's a very nice demonstrable physical sign here. I came back to check for the open sign and that. Because in severe cases, there is also intrinsic contracture that happens. Sir, no, no, he is not demonstrating as I'm not demonstrating as yet. I'm just telling you. I'm just telling you. Since the, I don't know how many of you heard what Dr. Sandeep Padwar then spoke in his lecture, he talked about Suge's classification, T-S-U-G-E, Suge's classification. Yep. And in Suge, this is a severe variety of the Volkman Dishima contracture. And when you have a severe variety, intrinsic contracture is also part of some of these severe varieties. Okay, so when you have intrinsic contracture, you must, the lumbaritis, they cause flexion of the MP joint and they cause you have extension by the long 
the long finger extensors and the IP joints are extended by the interosseum. Okay. Now, when I am keeping the fingers in flex in extension, in maximum extension, like that, I am able to flex the fingers nicely. Can you see that? The functional position of the hand is this. Why? Because the ligaments and the intrinsics are stretched to the maximum in this position. This, the intrinsic muscle, the So when I'm extending this, you're able to flex this nicely. When I'm flexing this, can you see that? So move the camera When I take it into flexion, there is almost like a springing which is happening. So there is a lot of stiffness and pain there. That's why. All these joints, the moment you flex, in this position flexion is possible, in this position there is... So, you, what, how will we manage this patient now? Uh, before we go on to the management, I want to emphasize on one very important point is, uh, whenever you have an upper extremity case, the first thing which you should do, try to convey to the examiner is, are we dealing with the dominant limb or the non-dominant limb? Because this problem is not there in the lower extremity, though we have a dominance there also. But function of both the lower extremities is identical. But in the upper extremity, dominant limb is much more, is, it's much more capable, much more textless. So it's important. Is it the is it right dominant hand. limb? Right so, a right hand dominant, it's a paralytic limb, no sensation there. A bit contractures. How will you manage this? We would like to take one instead of a right before a main patient. Okay, let's put the x ray there. X-ray is that? Do we have the x-ray or not? What that contracture is about? I'd like to do a serial NCV and DMG study with the dynamic splitting of the... You see, there is... I, I don't think it is required. Uh, and it's going to be... This hand is quite painful. What, wherever we... The, that is... You see, it's a little surprising that on one hand we have the anesthetic hand. And on the other hand, the moment you try to touch, uh, she has pain. You reach the end of the road on both the sides. And there is a long segment of fibrosis only. There is nothing else. There are procedures for that also. Nerve grafting yeah, procedures. Yeah. Nerve sacrificing to... Zero sacrificing the ulnar nerve to graft the... <coughs> medial nerve. These pro all these procedures are there. But the thing is, you have to just talk about the basic principles. So the basic principle is... Initially, splint, mobilize, protect the hand, wait, <coughs> do not be in a hurry. And then, maybe three months down the line, if nothing happens, and uh, there is a there is a procedure called Saint Clair Strange Nerve Grafting where the ulnar nerve is sacrificed to bridge the, yeah, the no, medium, no, gap no, in the medium yeah. nerve. It's a, it's a historical procedure, I think not being done now, because we have a long segments of sural nerve available to us for nerve grafting. Okay, and we do not, maybe it was being realized that uh, ulnar nerve also, if it can be restored, it would be a, a good thing. 
So now grafting procedures. This sunna nerve is also involved. The central stage may be a problem. May be a possibility. May be a possibility. So read about it. Saint clear strange nerve grafting. Uh, I think that that's that's uh, in a nutshell for this group. If you can tell all these things, you pass. Yeah. Please sit down. It's a very. And if one begin the fashion. Till about 70s, there were so many names that became unmanageable to train people and to tell people on how these things work. So the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons got together and came out with a nomenclature like the botanical names of plants. Huh? The nomenclature, taxonomy, huh? the nomenclature for orthopedic devices. And the current nomenclature is a simple, doesn't look at the opponents. In the exam, don't worry about names of orthotic leads. Try to understand the principle and then describe it for the person who is asking you the question. Okay? So, orthotic devices are devices that are applied or attached to a body part to protect a body part, to prevent a deformity, to correct a deformity, or to maintain a correction after it is achieved, <coughs> by strapping it on or attaching it on to the body. A prosthesis, on the other hand, is something which is replacement for a missing part. So orthotics are different from prosthetics. So sometimes in the exam, you might think it's a stupid way of telling we know all this. No. In the exam, what is this? Sir, it is an ankle foot prosthesis. So you can laugh here, but I am sitting on the other side of the desk and watching people and I am pained that they don't know the difference. It's painful. You think it is fun to fail people? No, it is not fun. It is painful. It is really painful. They are there, their families are there, They're, some of them are married, spouses eagerly waiting for the result, parents eagerly waiting for the results, friends waiting, we have all been good students. We have all been good students. You get into empty days with great difficulty. And when you go back to Tanare, it was a good feel. There are all kinds of things. So it's very painful. In fact, I, I, at the end of an exam day, I am really miserable. I am really miserable. You don't know what we go through as examiners. And we have a tough time. Because we don't enjoy this process of failing. But when you have things like this coming up, then it becomes difficult for us to say, you know, how do we push this? So we use only one criteria in deciding on failing. I am very clear. When I am an examiner, I am very clear on this. Is this boy going out in the community and operating going to be a harm to society. If he yes, he deserves to fail. If he's not going to be harmful to society, okay, he can push him. He can push him. That's my clear understanding on passing in field. So orthosis and process is no difference. And the key thing starts with the foot. In orthotic classification by the American Academy, you look at where is the particular orthotic device used. If it is used only for the foot, it is a foot orthosis. If it is used for the ankle and the foot, ankle foot orthosis. If it is used for the knee also, knee ankle foot orthosis. If it is used higher up, including the hip, hip knee ankle foot up. So, F O, A F O, K F O, H K F. Elementary. If it is used for just the hand, no, we don't have just the hand here. Just for the hand, it's a hand orthosis. That's a hand orthosis. If it is used for the 
wrist alone, like wristband and all, wrist orthosis. If it is used for the forearm, wrist and hand, forearm, wrist, hand orthosis. Simple. If it is used for the elbow, elbow orthosis, hinge elbow orthosis. So all simple nomenclature. If it is used for the lumbar spine, lumbar orthosis. If it is used for lumbar and sacral spine, lumbar sacral orthosis. If it is for the dorsal lumbo sacral orthosis, <coughs> dorsal lumbo sacral, also the tailor brace. If it is cervical collar, cervical orthosis. You don't want to say cervical collar. And you can feel it. Is it a hard cervical collar or a short so soft cervical collar? So you have to say a soft cervical collar or a hard cervical collar. So you need to look at what is it that you are seeing going to be used to the body part, which part, what is the extent. That extent becomes your nomenclature. Okay, now the commonest is like the shoe. This has got a shoe race. Isn't it? If you hold this, this is really heavy. Imagine a child walking with this kind of thing. So when you give one a shoe like this, and they, I hand over to the candidate and ask him, what is this? So he said, sir, this is a surgical shoe with a shoe race. No, this is not a surgical shoe. This is a normal shoe. The re reason it is important to know the difference is 